So now uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dini Grigar is a professor and director of the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program at Washington State University, Vancouver. Uh, her research focuses on the creation, curation, preservation, and criticism of born digital literature and net art. Uh, she is very prolific. She has authored 16 media works, such as Curlew and A Villager's Tale, as well as 71 scholarly articles and six books. She's curated exhibits at the British Computer Society, the Library of Congress, and for the Symposium on Electronic Art and the Modern Language Association, among other places. With Stuart Molthrop, I believe I'm, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, she developed the meth methodology for documenting born digital media, a project that culminated in an open source multimedia book entitled Pathfinders and a book of media art cri criticism entitled Traversals for MIT Press. Her most recent book is co-edited with James O'Sullivan, uh, published in 2021. It's entitled Electronic Literature as Digital Humanities. Uh, Dini served as president of the Electronic Literate Organization from 2013 to 2019 and is now the managing director and curator of the organization's The Next Project. So that's NEXT, capital, all capitals, N-E-X-T, The Next Project. Um, in 2017, she was awarded the Louis E. and Stella G. Buchanan Distinguished Professorship by her university, where she also directs the Electronic Literature Lab. Uh, back when I used to go to conferences, the MLA, I would meet Dini. I got a chance to see her perform and to, to talk with her. And I've been wanting to invite her to KU to speak for a long time. And so although we don't have her in person, um, I'm super happy that we were able to have her join us today. So Dini, thank you for joining us. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you for inviting me to the Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities, the Digital Storytelling, Coll Storytelling Coll Colloquium. And thanks, Brian. And thank you, Dave. And thank you, Kaylin, for inviting me to do this. Uh, I'm speaking on a topic that I've been, I've made a career of, 30 years of exploring this topic. And it's just amazing that I had to bring down thousands of works you know, into a small amount to talk about. So that was the challenge of, of, uh, of putting together this presentation. But as a way of organizing my talk and focusing it, I'm gonna start with three major points about digital storytelling and genres, right? So let me start with the first one. And that is um, born digital works that fall into this category are part of a long tradition of experimental writing seen in antecedents such as Dante Alighieri's Commedia in the 14th century, Lawrence Stern's The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy in the 18th, Gertrude Stein's The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas in the 20th, and Mark Z. Danieleski's House of Lees in the 21st. So any study of experimental fiction is not complete without exploring born digital storytelling because like storytelling in the print medium, it also experiments with form, language, concepts, possibilities of text, and what new media scholar Abby Delta Cosnick calls the cultural dominant medium of our time. Okay, so that's one of my basic premises with everything I do. Secondly, while genres of digital storytelling reflect to a certain degree characteristics of print-based literature, the affordances and the constraints of the electronic medium imbued born digital literature with qualities unique and inextricably tied to computing technologies. So for example, when the web, um, when the web browser and the web was introduced, the web browser um, introduced in the mid 1990s, artists recognized the ability of the web to widely distribute their work, their art in a way that was challenging to do so by mail. So fl mailing floppy disks was not easy. They also saw that the browser could extend the design possibilities to include color, um, sound, and movement. So this was a great breakthrough for them, right? Third, because of this connection, the computational aspect of digital storytelling, genres are conventionally expressed as a combination, this hybridity of digital qualities plus literary genre. This means a novel produces 
as a hypertext would commonly be referred to as a hypertext novel, for example. So hypertext plus novel. A story produced with flash software, a flash narrative. And you can see here lots of examples. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's some of the ones I'm talking about today, right? So what I plan to do is walk you through some examples of genres of digital stories from the net to the web, as the title suggests. And as I mentioned, this is not exhaustive, but rather just they represent some of the larger categories that have emerged over the years. And you can see here a listing of the ones I'm going to be talking about. And I asked um, Brian that if there's questions um, that come up in the chat at these kind of moments of ju these junctures, I'm happy to stop and answer questions. So Brian, if there's something there currently that someone has asked, please let me know because I'm happy to stop before I jump into Malloy's Uncle Roger. Is there anything currently? Uh, there's just a note from a couple people that the chat is disabled. So uh, let me work on that. Um, yeah, let's get that fixed. I'll, and, uh, I'll work on that while you're you're going. And yeah, just but once I get that done, uh, feel free to enter questions as you um, as you think of them, and we'll address them either during the presentation or afterwards. Um, and also, I forgot to mention at the beginning, I just posted in there. Uh, if you could enter your name and your department uh, where you're from, that will help uh our speaker kind of get a sense of who's there and and we can tailor the conversation a little a little further so so thanks everyone let, let me work on the chat here so i'm going to start with um judy malloy's uncle roger it's a long form narrative um referred to as a novel it was first introduced in 1986 and republished in several different genres until about 2012 and because it's been published on six different platforms and six different genres, it makes for a really fascinating study of genre and digital storytelling. And here's an image of Judy sitting in front of the Apple IIe during the traversal that Stuart Multhrop and I did at Princeton, where she was working um, back in 2013. So um, Uncle Roger, well, despite the title, focuses on the experiences of Jenny. I'm going to go back for a second, let you keep looking at Judy because she's just delightful to look at. Experiences of Jenny, who's moved to the Silicon Valley during the 1980s when the success of the semiconductor chip industry was measured by companies who could produce the fastest chip, right? This was historical in nature. She chronicles this period beautifully in this novel. The industry in espionage was a common practice, which she also reflects in the novel. Jenny herself is a nanny working for a family of uh, tech com entrepreneurs called the Broadbells. And um, she takes a job later on as in data entry, right? So Uncle Roger is her questionably ethical uncle, uh, himself involved in stealing proprietary um, software, right? And so um, he also gets involved with a lot of other shenanigans. It depends on which version of the work you read. The story unfolds in three parts. The first is called A Party at Woodside, which takes place, as the title suggests, at a party, which allows for a lot of different activities and action and characters and interactions. And it, uh, the second one is called Blue Notebook, and it's told from the perspective of, of a kind of, kind of dreamlike occurrences, um, it's got five different streams of, of, of discussions and retrospect that Jenny tells, um, and it's not she's not completely a credible character in this storytelling. So you don't know if she's telling the story, you know, um, truth truthfully or if it's just the way she wants to remember things. And the third one is called Terminals, which is both metaphorically and literally the end of the narrative and reflects the data entry work that Jenny's doing at the end of her at the end of the storyline. Um, this work actually is interesting because it's maybe the one of the first social media narratives that were at, was ever produced, and it presages Twitter that came much later and some of the work I'm going to show you today. So what you're looking at here is the like a, a chart of the various genres that Uncle Roger was published as, and you can see in the first one, um, I'm going to move this little element here from the chat if I can get that down out of the way there we go the first is a serial novel the second is an interactive novel she then produced it as a database novel a hypertext novel and a 
another database novel. So there's so many different versions of this work, and there's even some um, analog versions of it. So, but you can see that all these different versions require different software programs, so different platforms. And most of them took place during this period of 1986 to 1988. So I want to start with the first one, and that is a serial novel. So this is the first edition of Uncle Roger, um, version one, edition one, built on the bulletin board technology or BB, BBS. PicoSpan was the system that was being used. It showed up on the well, which was the whole earth electric link. And um, the first moment she, the first night that she posted was December 1st in 1986. So um, it, she began to deliver these little snippets of text over the well on the BBS nightly. And she did this for the, for the hundred lexias that, that comprise the three different um, you know, sections of the work. And what's interesting is that while she was posting this on topic 14, um, you might have heard the name Howard Rheingold. Howard Rheingold was also in the well and a friend of hers. He was posting information about it on another topic, 15, I think it was topic 15, and people were responding, reading her work and responding to it in topic 15 and asking her questions. And she'd get up in the morning and there'd be people that have read it the night before and they respond to her and she responds back. And so there was this give and take of the audience. And Uncle Roger. And what we're looking at here is the topic 15 responses to Judy Malloy's Uncle Roger um, from the serial novel. This I, is an image I took from the Rubenstein Library. I'm here currently at Durham, North Carolina at uh, Duke, and I'll be going to the Rubenstein tomorrow where the Judy Malloy papers are being kept. And I've scanned a lot of the work there. It's not, in great, not a great scan, but you can get a sense of how this printout reads. Um, in a kind of bitmap look, um, but this was the way this was produced in these tiny snippets of text. While she, when she did that, it was really popular. I mean, people, it was just, the, the story is so rich and so complex, a wonderful story. It hit the nerve of the people on the well, and they encouraged her to turn it into an interactive novel. And this type of platform allowed people to download the story onto their desktop and type in commands, right? So what you're looking at here is an image from the Rubenstein collection of Malloy's papers of the ArtCom Electric Network from the well that allowed her to, to do this work as an interactive novel produced in 1987 to 88. It's the second edition of her work. Um, just so you'll know, um, I've, one of the things I do in my research is to version and edition all the works of electronic literature that I um, collect and archive in my lab. Um, I'm doing this because somebody that wants to access it needs to know, you know, what that work entails, you know, what, what it means to be um, able to access it. So it's, it's a way to think through um, access issues. While she was working on that version, the folks at the well came back to her and said, you know what, we really want it on five and a quarter inch floppy disks for the Apple IIe, let's, let's make some of those. So she did. So versions three, four, five, six, and seven are editions um, built in Apple for Apple II um, computers and for IBM PC computers. For the Apple II computers, she built it in AppleSoft Basic. For the IBM, she built it in GW Basic. And you can see here an image of the Apple IIe and the word bad on the screen is the first kind of thing that happens when you put the floppy disk in, the computer makes a bunch of noise and then bad information shows up on bitmap green screen on the computer and then it goes into the Uncle Roger story. You can see next to the computer, the little box. So these are um, floppy disks that she made handmade um, slips for, so you would slip them in, and then you could see on the down below the picture of the computer, the handmade um, cover for these floppy disks. 
And these three, each one of the, on the, for the Apple version, there were three floppy disks that she put in a box, in a plastic box that she also decorated with a handmade label. And then she would mail those out, right? She, so she advertised it in the Artcom uh, catalog for $15. And she'd get home at the end of the day, find a couple of envelopes in the mail. She would go and fix these boxes and put these, these floppies into it and then mail them back out. For the GW Basic Apple, um, the uh, IBM version, these were interesting because she was able to get all three stories onto one floppy disk. Um, and so that's the, that's the way you can recognize the difference between the IBM and the, and the Apple uh, versions. Also, the Apple um, always are portrayed on the green screen, whereas the IBMs are on, on black and white. So you're looking at two different database novels. Now, what's interesting, Interesting about the database novels is that she actually took the 100 Lexias, mapped them out in her notebooks, trying to figure out how to organize them in the database so that as you typed in the number of Alexia, it would show up on the screen. So there you're looking at currently, you know, one, two, three, four, five, 37 on this page, all the way down to 74 on this page. There are a hundred of these Lexias divided into the three different stories. And you can see who the characters are, how they show up. And this is how she, how she conceptualized the novel as a database. So you would type in um, a, a number, and, um, and in the Apple version, you could type in the two, two different ones side by side, and the two would show up and you could read through it. And then you type in again. So it was a really fascinating way to tell a story. In 1995, the browser was released, right? And so when the browser was released, that meant that people could actually distribute the work over the web. The web existed long before there were browsers, right? Um, Tim Berners-Lee introduced the browser in the 80s, but there was not an easy way to produce work and make it available um, you know, without the HTML, right? It was really hard. I did my first website in 1993 and it was all command line and it wasn't very pretty. It was all in black and white, but the browser made it possible to do color and to distribute it over the web and reach a whole lot of people without having to mail things, right? So the eighth through 10th editions of, of Judy Malloy's Uncle Roger is the hypertext novel, as we call it. And the well was smart enough to get a domain name and get a server space, and she published it, Uncle Roger on the well space in 1995, web-based version, version five. Now, sat there on the web, she you know, would periodically go in and do some, some um, updates. But in 2012, she decided to make a DOSBox emulated version. So if you know anything about gaming and DOSBox, this is an interesting version. It's the 11th version, it's the sixth version, the 11th edition of Uncle Roger 2012. And just a side note, one of the things I did in studying this work for the, for the MIT book was I copied all 100 Lexias for each of the six different versions. So I have handwritten copies and I did a textual analysis of each of these different platforms, versions for the platforms. And what I found was the standalone computer versions of Uncle Rogers. Imagine you're at home on your Apple IIe, you've got your little software program, you put it in, you're by yourself in your house, and you're looking at it, and you're able to, you know, read through this thing. So the, the kind of story that she was telling in these standalone systems had a little more sexuality, sexual content in it. When she moved it to the web, where anybody, anytime, could sit down, including a 10-year-old child, and access it, she uh, modified the text and took some of the sexual content out, the more sexual content out, changed some names and changed some, some incidences and things like that. And I chronicled that in my text analysis of the work. What's interesting about the docs box simulated version, she, if you read anything about it, she says, this is, uh, you know, this is version four of my, of my, you know, GW basic, um, PC version, but it's not. It's it, it's the coding from it, the programming from it, but it's the content from the web. 
because this is still downloadable from the net, right? So anybody that wants to get this, including a 10 year old child who knows how to play with games could read the sexual content. So it really is the content from the web version, which is a lot less racy and the, um, the uh, programming from the version four. So I find that a fascinating thing, but this once again is a database novel. Were there any questions about this um, before I get into the next section of this, Brian or Dave or Kaylin? <clears throat> Well, the question we have here in the in the Q and A is about copyright laws. Uh, so, Ooh. how do how do, do copyright laws differ for born for born digital writing? This is from Allison uh, for born digital writing, and how do authors protect their contributions? There's so, really not any difference. I we have um, I'm overseeing a, a a museum right now that has three thousand works in it, and we follow copyright. So, unless we have permission of the author and editor. We don't in the publishing house. We don't put things online. There's creative, you know, creative commons. A lot of the work that people are doing today for the web is open, right? Um, but these early works, these the this, the material that was published on Eastgate Systems Inc.'s, you know, um, Primitur back in the you know late '80s, early '90s, mid '90s. 2000s, that was actually uh, copyrighted. And so that's why Stuart Multhrop and I developed the documentation methodology for, for these works, because there was no legal way for us to make those works available. And I'm going to be honest with you, this stuff is pioneering. And the fact that people couldn't read it anymore because they're on floppy disks, they didn't have an Apple you know, 1984 Apple or 1992 Apple product. You know, it was to me that was a depressing situation. So we developed this methodology to do video documentation, a whole lot of other kind of documentations to make that work available. Since the last couple of years, Mark Bernstein, the owner of uh, Eastgate, has given me permission and artist permission to reconstruct some of the works. So my lab has done a lot of reconstruction on works um, that were very important in the early 90s. Right now, my lab is, and my students in my program are reconstructing Uncle Buddy's Phantom Fun House, for example, and that will be ready in, in December. So copyright's very important, and it's not that different. Um, I do seek permission. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Dini. There's a couple more. Um, and also, you can see uh, folks have put their names and departments there in the chat. Most of these folks, or a lot of them, are, are fellows. Uh, so you may be familiar with some of their work already. Um, question from Kaylin and also one from Dave. Uh, Kaylin asks, uh, I'm trying to understand the process of the first edition serial BBS Pico Span. This was a discussion forum. That's your question. Yes. The, black, the bulletin boards are really a fun technology. So, and they're very clunky today for us, but at the time they were like, oh my gosh, we can post things to people over the net, right? So that's the net, not the web, the net. And so BBS technology was very, um, you know, popular among, you know, the net netizens as we called ourselves. And so you would actually go into the well system and you go online with your modem and you type in your, your text, and then it would sit on your system site, which was for her was topic 14. Everybody had their topic. And on topic 14, it would say Uncle Roger, Judy Malloy, and people then could like click on it, right, go to it, read it. And then they would go to topic 15, that Howard Rheingold had set up for and make comments. Judy, I love this work. This is great. Hey, you know, um, have you thought about blah, blah, blah? And so then she would read that and respond. And what was interesting is that the story unfolded over several months, right? Started in December, ended much later than that. So she was emboldened by the comments she was receiving, the feedback. It's kind of like when you're on Twitter, you post something, somebody goes, oh, this is so cool. You should do, you, 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 tell me more. And then you start to really get a sense of what your audience wants and you tailor your story to your audience, right? And so that's what she was doing. And her audience were people from the Bay Area in the you know Berkeley, 
Stanford kind of mentality, um, kind of kind of wealthy, educated, elite. They can they own a computer back in those days, which was not a cheap thing. And so she had a, an audience that was quite, you know, interested in this topic of technology that she was writing about with Uncle Roger. I hope that answered your question, but it's a lot like Twitter, but a lot slower and not as multitasking. It's like very clunky. Great, thanks, Deanie. Um, Dave, did you wanna ask your question? Sure, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, I have a lot of questions. And first of all, I'm just kind of amazed that people could post things in 1986. I didn't know, I know. that. <laughs> um, and so maybe like, but first I was tempted to ask what is the well? And, and now I'm tempted to ask uh, if you could clarify the distinction on net versus web. And I have a hunch those things are connected to each other. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I love that question. So you're gonna laugh at this, but in 1993, when I was a graduate student, I went to, I was doing, I was doing workshops. And the first one I did was at uh, Ann Arbor for the Computers of Writing Conference. I did one in 93, 94, and 95. And my and the, and I did it with several friends, right? We're all kind of new, newly minted, kind of graduate students, newly minted PhDs, and we were really into the tech and into into technology in those days. And um, the what we would tell people is, you know, the net is this thing, and in the net, this umbrella term in the net, we have gophers you know, that we would use, we would play with BBS, we would play with, there's all these different tools, email was part of it. There are all these different kind of tools within this, con this confines of the net. And the net was everything and cyberspace was all about the net. Max Headroom was all about the net, right? Cyberspace was the net. And then the web became kind of one of these things of the net, right? I, I made my first website in 93. So the web was part of the net, one of many things like email. By the time the browser mainstreamed to the public by 97, we no longer talked about the net, we talked about the web. So that one technology that was part of this umbrella of technologies called the net took over the conversation. And we no longer talk about the net, we talk about the web. And in fact, the net became, the web became synonymous with the net, became, the net became consumed by the word, the net. So when we talk, when I talk about net art in a minute, what I'm talking about is web art. It just became part of this thing. The web became the predominant media form of this technology. And in those days, to get on the net, you had to have a modem. And you'd hear that noise, you dial in, you know, you're on the phone and you're dialing in and it takes over your phone line and you get on and you've got this kind of rudimentary bitmap look kind of interface on your computer and there's things you can do. And one of them was to visit. I did my, my dissertation on Homer's Penelope and I was using the net to go to museums and, and libraries all around the world and people were, libraries were just going online at the time. So I was able to get into the Harvard Library which they hadn't locked down yet, right? It was all open and people were advertising on listservs. Hey, you know, the Harvard Library's online, come visit. And I'd say, okay. And I would type in and follow the, the links or the kind of linking system that was there to get to the library and look at the card catalog and do my research. Since then, it all is behind a firewall. I can't do that anymore. I have to be paying my, tu my tuition to be seeing that stuff. But in those days, it was like, what open? It was, you know, like wildcatting. Everybody was showing off, showing their stuff and proud that they were making work available. It was a really exciting time. I, I got my first computer in, in 1982 when I was working at University of New Orleans, but my first home computer in 86. So I began playing with, um, with computers in 86. So long time, kind of tells you how old I am. <laughs> Let me go ahead and turn my attention to something that, that goes back to those, harkens back there to the net um, day, which is Dina Larson's samplers. This was published on a three and a half inch floppy disk, right? And today when I teach this stuff to my students, I have to like hold up a floppy disk and say, this is a floppy disk. And I put it into a, to the drive on a computer and let them watch it boot up because they don't, they don't know what this is, right? So it's on a floppy disk, came out later as a CD-ROM. Um, it took up five and a half 
um, megabytes, which was a lot back in those days. This was published by Eastgate Systems Inc. It's under copyright. And so um, I did do a traversal of this. So all of this, you can actually get a good sense of this work if you look at the video documentation I did of it. Um, it was built in StorySpace software, very fascinating piece. The title is Samplers, Nine Vicious Little Hypertext, right? So um, yeah, it's very fun. What's What's interesting is that she uses the metaphor of quilt to talk about her work. This is actually the one of the first anthologies of little stories. So she's written nine little short stories, you know, if you're going to put it in some sort of literary um, genre, short narratives in hypertext using story space software, all in one anthology. And the, the notion of samplers is really interesting, but the but metaphorical language is really important at this time. If you can imagine back in 1997, people were just starting to understand, you know, how to get online, how to put, you know, I used to teach in a Mac lab in 1990 and just teaching my students how to put a floppy disk into a drive, you know, and talking to them about the difference between hardware and software. I mean, mainstream America didn't get there to the 90s. Right, so mid 90s. So in 1997, a lot of these artists were using metaphorical language um, to help people understand the concepts and structures of their work. And what you're looking at here is the fun house from Uncle Buddy's Phantom Fun House, which is the way he structured his stories um, and the work that we're currently um, reconstructing. Um, to the left of that is Shelley Jackson's Monster Body, very famous hypertext novel called Patchwork Girl. The, the image you're looking down below that are the rhizomes. So the notion of rhizomatic, rhizomes, the way hypertext functions. For those of you that are, you know, fellows that, that are younger, my gosh, you don't even think about a hypertext anymore. Hypertext is just ubiquitous. But if you go into the CNN news and you click on links to things, that clicking, and as you're moving through a text and navigating through a series of stuff in a in a site, that was so new in the 90s. It was it freaked people out, right? It was like, oh my God, I can go from this text to this text. It was fascinating. So these artists really had to think about ways to structure their work so that new people coming to the technology could understand what they were doing. So uh, metaphorical for, for language is really important. And in, in this work, in samplers, it's, it's vital because uh, a sampler quilt is one whose patches do not repeat the same pattern, but instead offers unique quilt blocks throughout as a way that demonstrates the, the kind of mastery of the quilter's craft, right? They were showing off. Um, by not repeating things. And there were some, some structural, um, conventional um, uh, quilting patterns that were really important, right, in this, in this craft. So Larson draws upon um, established quilt blocks uh, for her sampling of stories, sampling of stories, hence the word samplers. So recognizing, so if anybody that quilts, if you recognize uh, Larson's design, you, you understand what she's trying to do. You get a sense of the, of the expertise, the kind of storytelling techniques that she's using in this anthology. Each quilt blocks um, offers a unique story with a unique structure. And I'm giving you two of the nine here. <clears throat> what you're looking at here is Mystic Knot um, and Firewheel and Mystic Knot evokes the art of knotting, which is a technique um, used for binding heavy fabrics. And in the story that takes place in Mystic Knot, we have a um, fantasy about a traffic, um, a traffic barrier that comes to life, right? It comes alive, which is interesting. And um, in San Francisco, and his job is to um, kind of block traffic. Right. And so the whole story is about him seeing himself as a god. He's blocking traffic. He's controlling the universe. So the notion of the nodding is reflected in the nodding of this of this activity that this barrier is doing. It's really, really fun the way she does that. The second one is fire will. And you can see these kind of these spines coming out, these fires, these flames coming out. There's 12 of them. 
And this story is about a young American who's teaching in Japan in a small or you know, rural village in Japan. And this person comes into contact with the mystic and spiritual world of this, of this culture in this time period. And so the, um, the story asked readers to move forward and backwards. And I, I have here the actual screen capture. So the 12 um, flames of the, of the Firewell um, sampler block is reflected in the way she structured the story space document, which I think is just brilliant, right? And I mean, she's just brilliant. And so when you're reading this, you're reading it kind of in a, circle starting from the top around and then you can read it from the top around the other direction but you can also read it by just clicking on anything non-sequentially that you want no matter how you read it though we experience the merging of the two worlds that the that the the the, the character experiences in this in this story the myth, the mythic and the experiential existence that permeates this culture. So when you talk to Dina Larson, if you ever get a chance to talk to her, she, she's noted for saying structure equals meaning. Everything she does has a structure and all that structure carries with it a, a certain meaning. So really fun. Dini, uh, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. An interesting question from Allison. Did any of these earlier works use steganography? uh which is like hidden hidden i think it's like hidden hidden messages um yes you could say that yes let me let me tell you about one example so the early hypertext um story space works michael joyce's um stuart malthrop and a lot of these early pioneers when you're making when you're working in story space it looks like twines so if, you, if you've ever played in twine you know you you make a box and you put some text in, you make another box, you put some text in and you can draw connections between those texts and you can go from box to box, text to text. That technology was what story space was all about. Story space was um, and kind of developed by Michael Joyce, J. David Bolter and John B. Smith and was shown at the Hypertext Conference in 1987. And Mark Bernstein saw it, fell in love Love with it and license it and publish the first work in 1990, which is Michael Joyce's Afternoon of Story, a very famous work. Now, when you're making these little boxes and you're putting your work in it, sometimes you forget to connect the box. Sometimes you purposely don't connect the box. And so we call those purposefully forgotten to be linked text boxes, the Jane space, named after J. Yellowleaf Douglas, who discovered this little quirky thing that Michael Joyce did in Afternoon of Story and others had done. And so Jane space are these hidden texts, and you can't get them by clicking through, but you can get them by looking at the maps. Just like I showed you the maps of Dina Larson's. Imagine you're looking at that map, and you're going, wait a minute, there is a there's a box there that doesn't have any strings attached to it. What's that? Well, that's Dina's way of hiding text. So if you're re really having some fun and you want to be gameful, you want to look at the map view of these works and find those Jane spaces. So that's one example. And there's a lot of others. That, and so, yeah, I guess in, in a sense, perhaps. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for answering that. Yeah. So now I'm going to talk about interactive fiction. And what you're going to notice is I'm not going in chronological order. I was doing this by just kind of like associative thinking, right? Interactive fiction <clears throat> actually is one of the, it's the oldest um, that we have record of in terms of digital storytelling. And um, it's attributed to coming out of the experiment with the ELISA program. So I'm sure a lot of you in the humanities have come across the ELISA program in which um, was a program that developed a have people in a psych, kind of psychotherapy to, to talk to this machine, this AI, artificial intelligence, and, um, and talk about their problems. And Eliza would respond back, right? So it was that kind of rudimentary thing. And so, some other programs came out after that had really good AI intentionality in it. And so um, interactive fiction is seen through works like Will Crowther's Adventure or The Colossal Cave Adventure in 1975. He, he utilizes technology for that game. 
So that's the first that we have record of, right? But I'm going to talk about a more recent one, a, a famous one called Galadia by Emily Short. And you're going to notice that the, the works I'm showing you are a lot of, um, a lot of women, people of color. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working very hard to be extremely diverse because there's thousands of work to choose from. And I'm showing you not the normal, like, um, conventional list that you would see posted somewhere, but I'm not talking about real, real crawler. I'm talking about Emily. So um, that's the method to my madness here. Scaladia was published in 2000 and it was made in Inform with Inform, which is a platform that you can do a kind of parser based technology. And it's a story about a, um, uh, takes place in a, like a, a museum and the player is a um, curator that, or critic, excuse me, a critic that walks into the museum and begins to have a conversation with this the statue that comes alive and the statue is a woman who seems to be have awakened from her state of being a statue and now she's this living creature and you're talking to her and as you ask her questions she responds so um there's a conversation between the critic and the marble sculpture of a woman so using text entries into this um command text commands into these into the buffer the player interacts with galadia the statue she can express over 400 different responses to a player's command. There's actually 25 different possible endings. It's very multilinear. Um, Emily Short writes a lot about her work. And if you type in her name and type in Galadia, you can get to her website. But she says, quote unquote, the game also takes an ambitious approach to NPCs. Those of you who are gamers know that an NPC is a non-player character. Um, convention, both in terms of volume Galadia has a lot of like hundreds of things that she can say and complexity. She keeps track, which is interesting. She keeps track of the conversation and she reacts differently according to what has been said already and what's been done already. So she's artificial, almost like an artificial intelligence creature without being so. Galadia exemplifies what, um, sh what Emily Short calls procedurally driven storytelling. So it's it's interesting because it's command line, you type in and you say like, look statue. And you know, and so you type in your command and then you type the noun and then something happens. And so then the, she speaks to you and then you respond to her and she respe responds back. So it's extremely interactive in this very um, text-based environment. And you can see her, look at Galadia. She's facing away from you. You cannot see her face, only her hair. This is a very um, robust community, IF, and Inform is the platform that a lot of them are using. There's others, but we teach Inform 7. We're on the Inform 7 version currently. So Gladia. Now I'm going to jump forward a little bit to um, locative narrative. And I think I was talking to Dave about his work. Dave, your work is an example of locative narrative. In this case, though, people are moving around the space um, imagining an, uh, an environment that's different than what they were, that, that, that's in front of them, right? So while movement was is important in these early works on the screen, so things happen on the screen, what Jeremy Haidt and Naomi Spellman and Jeff Knowles did was quite remarkable. They moved away from the computer environment into the world. They went kind of at the wild and they used GPS technology in order to tell a story. And what was interesting is that their, their narrative is called 34 North, 118th West. So it's it's set up in, into the uh, latitude and longitude. And it's noted for introducing a kind of storytelling that's locative. So it imagines the user moving through a freight depot in LA at the turn of the 20th century. They're accessing, as they're moving along this space using these maps, they're moving along the space and they get to a hot spot. and you, the GPS technology um, then ev evokes sound. And the sound are sounds that reflect this early industrial period of the city. So as you move around, you can see on the map here, the little red boxes, those are hot spots. And then we get there and then something would happen. So sound sonic event would be evoked as they as they hit that hot spot. 
this technology is being used now in mobile technology on phones. But in this time period, in, in 2002, they were using a, a much different system because you didn't have wireless and cellular quite like, you, like as robust as today. They built this with director as the um, technology to, to kind of evoke the sound. So Jeremy Hyde died just recently, um, and I encourage you to look at his work, but he, uh, he did a lot of groundbreaking work, and he's known for this particular piece, Locative Narrative. So I am going to move to mobile now, so mobile narratives or mobile games, and talk about Eric Lawyer's Strange Rain. And I'm going to say this, um, if I were to pick any mobile work to say this, this quintessential mobile narrative that you have got to experience, it would be this one. And unfortunately, you can't experience it anymore because it's, it's the technology is dead. It was done in 2011. Sounds like, oh, 10 years ago, no big deal. But the Apple iPhone has, you know, the, the, uh, the, um, the OS that has, you know, continued to upgrade. And that upgrading has just kind of killed off a lot of those um, apps from the early 2000, kind of mid 2000s. So we're, we've lost strange rain. My lab is trying to recreate it for the open web right now. And it's very difficult. This story is quite beautiful. I mean, you look at the screen and I'm going to play the little video clip in a second, but imagine that you're a character named Alphonse and um, you're standing outside and it's raining and your sister is very ill and you're contemplating how you're going to help your sister. So you're very sad and um, dealing with this family crisis. And as you're standing outside holding your phone, rain starts to fall. And as the rain falls in the story, the, it falls on the, the interface of the phone. So you start to see raindrops on the phone interface. And then as you touch the phone and move your fingers around, you start to see other events occur. The sky grows dark, a, a, a jet flies overhead. So there's, there's this really wonderful haptic and touch technology that became possible because of the Apple iPhone, smartphone, iPad technologies from 2007 onward. And Eric is known for um, accessing that, harnessing it for storytelling. This app was downloadable from the Apple iStore. He sold it at the iStore and became quite famous for it. CNN did a giant story on him. He sold a lot of copies. And so um, it's considered kind of like the pioneering work. Let me very quickly show you a little video clip. Hello. This is strange rain. Let's start by exploring the wordless mode. Strange rain turns your device into a skylight on a rainy day. So it's just as if you're looking up at the sky, rain's coming towards you, it's hitting the screen. And as you tilt the device, you get changes in perspective, almost like you're holding a handheld camera. As I touch the screen, the rain's attracted to where my finger is, and I can literally guide where the rain falls. And there's a bit of a waltz that plays in the background as I'm touching. When I go a bit deeper into the experience, I can enter Whispers mode. And Whispers mode adds the element of text. So we see raindrops turning into words as they fall. It adds another layer to the experience. If I want to go even deeper, I can enter Story mode. In story mode, each touch triggers a thought. And these thoughts are coming from a character who's having a family crisis and has gone outside in the backyard to just think things through a bit and get rained on and contemplate what's going on. I can touch for individual thoughts or drag for sequences of thoughts.
You might notice as we're getting deeper into the experience that some strange things are starting to happen. We're starting to see some layers in the sky. See some other strange phenomena as you go on. And the deeper you go, the more of these kind of things will occur. So I'll stop there. It's really a fascinating piece and I, one of my favorites. And so we're working hard to try to reconstruct it. We're having to rebuild it in HTML5 CSS, JavaScript, but also J, uh, 3JS, which is a really um, allows all that interactivity and that the kind of the, the, the raindrops to occur. So, so that's strange rain. Are there questions about that work at all? Is there anything that people want to know more about it before I go on to the next piece? Okay, I'll just keep going. All right, so I'm going to go backwards a little bit and talk about net art some more. So this is um, I'm going back to the late 1990s to the early 2000s when NetArt was on the rise because of open web technologies and then Flash, which became very popular. And I'm going to talk about Flash in just a second. This is Rodriguez's Gabriela Infinita. He's a Colombian artist. This was done first and published in 1995 as a nonlinear novel. But then he reconceptualized it as a cyber novel in 1997. And the story focuses, and I like this work because it focuses on a character named Gabriella, who is pregnant and searching for her missing boyfriend, Federico. And um, it's in the midst of a siege in a building in an urban Bogota, Bogota, Bogota in Colombia. It's divided into three parts. There's a part called Ruins, a part called Moving, and a part called Revelations. And as, the, as a work of hypermedia, it includes text, images, audio, video, a whole lot of different media, media types. Now, what's interesting, the reason why I like this work is in 1997, as I mentioned, people would get, on, get into a work and start clicking on things and get lost. So navigating became part of the literary experience. We don't think of navigation as something you do in a book. You simply turn the pages and maybe you navigate by opening up the book and going to a new page, but navigation is not really um, something that stands out as a major force for storytelling and print because it's linear. But navigation became really important with hypertext because you can navigate all over the place and get lost. So the story is devised, once again, structure equals meaning. As the reader gets lost in the text, Gabriella is searching and is lost looking for Federico. So he was reflecting this, this experience that users were having, readers were having with hypertext at the time. The other part I like about it is it's participatory. And so readers could, could actually write in a blog their responses to the work, which added a, a dimension to the actual text, right? So they can contribute to the story in the form of a blog. Very interesting for 1997. Um, so uh, when I think of electronic literature or born digital literature storytelling, I think of three things. If you, if you learn anything today, it's this. Those works are participatory, interactive, and experiential. And the experiential part comes from the media-rich environments, perhaps being thrown out into the wild, walking around with the GPS technology. That's experiential. The interactivity is this give and take between you and the, and the story, you know, and the technology that has been built into it. For example, shorts, Galadia. But then the participatory is you having to kind of engage with the work and help build the story along. So these, these works I'm talking about can be all three or a couple of these three way things or one of these things, but I call it PI participatory, interactive, and experiential. That's the features of the kind of work that I'm talking about. Hi, Dean. I mentioned- Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, just to, to interject for a second. Um, we had uh, told people and planned for this to end at, uh, whatever, at, at now at the top of the hour, whatever time zone we're, we're all in. Um, did you have a lot more here? I mean, I'm happy to stay on, but I noticed that some people are uh, Leave, are leaving yeah. because of it's the top of the top of the. Hour. I can just go to the end and just make my final statement. Okay, okay, and I, I do have a ton of questions, um, but uh, we'll have time with you tomorrow, so maybe we can yeah, yeah, follow great. up on some of those too. Yeah, sounds great. Sorry about that. I no, got that's, that's okay. I, <laughs> 
not monitoring it closely myself. So, okay, um, sorry to interrupt. Go, go ahead. ahead to these others. And this was a synopsis of everything that I was talking about. And it gives you a list of all the different genres that I'm, that I'm, it was presenting today. But the last thing I do want to say is this, my final statement is, um, let me get to this comment here. So stepping back, we can see that the through line in my presentation is that of the various works of genres, of digital storytelling is that each time a new technology, um, a new affordance emerges, artists take advantage of the opportunity to experiment with it. Whether it was a system that allowed for greater distribution like BBS or web browser, um, Judy Malloy um, used in the first and eighth editions of her Uncle Roger, a software program like Flash, which Kate Pullinger uses for Inanimate Alice, which is a fantastic series of works, or even the Instagram platform that the Marino family's coronation was published on. This is the nature of creative expression, of the human impetus to, to explore and think beyond the boundaries of creative expression. And I say this to everybody and it's like a broken record. If someone says to me, I don't, you know, I, I love experimental, I love experimental print narratives. I love House of Leaves, but I don't think, you know, electronic literature is valuable. I'll say, if you think experimental literature is important, then you need to be looking at this work too. You can't draw the line between print and electronic because a lot of these artists started their careers as print authors. And they saw this new medium as a way to expand their color, their palette, their, their artist palette to think beyond the boundaries of print. And there's, it's just a fascinating thing to think about. So you, you really need to explore. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna be a digital storytelling expert, you need to know the print and the electronic side by side so that you can see what humans are doing. And the question to ask yourself is, here comes a new technology. What's somebody gonna do with it? What's Judy gonna do with it? What's Dina gonna do with it? What's Eric gonna do with it? How are they gonna push the boundaries of human expression with that technology? And I encourage you all to, to visit the museum that I have you know, contributed to building and founding for the Electronic Literature Organization. There's thousands, there's 3000 works collected here um, and there will be more added you know, um, as the days move on. So please join me in looking at that space and um, ask any questions you want, write me an email. I'm happy to, to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dini. This is also, I find this also so fascinating. I could listen to all of this for, for hours. Um, we do have one question uh, in the chat and if you have time, I can yeah. go for that. Uh, so this is from Allison and uh, it's about uh, quantum computing and mm -hmm. states uh, that allows for states between the zero and one binary. Um, what impact do you think that this will have on technical works, technical possibilities for born digital works? Uh, we were just talking about this last night at dinner. I'm so glad you asked this question. I, I really hate, I really hate the binary in the in the way the computers are set up currently, zero and one. I think the way we've we structured the universe around the binary is has been detrimental to human expression, to human life. And because things aren't necessarily all binary, there are binary elements to our world, but that's not where it begins and ends, right? And so quantum mechanics is going to really um, show us what non-binary or multi-binary might be. So I think that's the first thing to think about conceptually. It's going to change the way we think about binary status. Um, if we can ever get past the problems with, um, with energy and the way it's going to cause all kinds of energy consumption, if we can get past the, that, that problem, it's going to really change the way we we are able to even um, disseminate information, uh, the, the speed at which we can disseminate information. And God knows the technologies that we're going to be able to, to spin out of that. So I think it, all of us that are in the field are just waiting. I'm hoping I live long enough to see it. Not sure if I will or not, but I hope to God I do. And I hope when we do that it's not going to be as energy um, inefficient as it is currently being imagined. So. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other last questions? I know most of us will have a chance to uh, work with Dini some more 
more tomorrow. And um, we're really looking forward to that. So 